polarity, and specifically how to identify when molecules are polar versus nonpolar versus ionic. Uh, that's going to be the subject of this lesson. Now we're in chapter one of my brand new organic chemistry playlist, and this is a Gen Chem review, and it ends with a, a discussion of molecular properties. And we've got to talk about polarity because in the next lesson we're going to talk about intermolecular forces, uh, and specifically dipole-dipole forces are for polar molecules. So we're going to have to identify when they're polar and when they're not. Now again, this is my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications, you'll be notified every time I release one. Okay, so a discussion of electronegativity is at the heart of polarity. And uh, oftentimes we, you know, gave you some working definitions uh, uh, of how to identify if something's ionic or if a compound's covalent and if you got, uh, you know, pure covalent bonds or non-polar covalent bonds and stuff. So well, in Gen Chem, we gave you some really generic, you know, kind of rules. I said metal and non-metal, ionic. Two non-metals, covalent. Uh, and then we just said two non-metals, usually if they're different but not carbon and hydrogen, well, they're probably going to be polar. Okay. Well, we've got a, a more exact definition, and you're not going to have a table of, of electronegativities on you at all times, but I do want to point out a couple key things so you see some differences. Now, uh, when we gave you those definitions of like metal and non-metal ionic and two non-metals covalent, stuff like that, we were oversimplifying it a little bit, and, and we're kind of lying to you in a couple places. There are exceptions to that general trend, and I want to point a couple of those out that'll be important and significant for organic chemistry. So uh, if we look at electronegativity, and I've put the Pauling scale up on your screen there, so uh, the way it works is the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the more polar a bond gets. Now, if that difference in electronegativity reaches 1.7 or greater, it's now become so big that it's so polar, we don't even call it polar covalent anymore, we call it ionic at that point. But a difference in electronegativity that's less than 1.7 is going to be covalent. Now, anywhere in the range of 0.5 to 1.7, that's going to be a polar covalent bond. And then anything less than 0.5 for a difference, we'll call that either non-polar covalent or pure covalent. All right, so let's take a look at some bonds here. And uh, I want to center this around carbon since this is organic chemistry. And if we just look at two identical atoms, well, that's going to be a nonpolar bond because if you've got two identical atoms, that's just a difference of zero. And that's about as pure covalent or nonpolar covalent as you can get. So, but take a look at even a carbon hydrogen bond. It's very important that you recognize that this is considered a nonpolar bond as well. So, if you look, carbon's at 2.5, hydrogen's at 2.1. And so that's just a difference of 0 0.4, less than the 0.5 threshold to be called polar. So that's considered a nonpolar covalent bond. That'll be super important when we start looking at uh, properties of molecules in the next section. Cool, so let's look at some polar ones here. And let's take a look at the carbon nitrogen bond. And for a carbon nitrogen bond, carbon's at 2.5, nitrogen's at 3.0, and we're right at the threshold to be considered polar covalent. And if we kind of move our way up to carbon oxygen bond, now 2.5 compared to 3.5, 1.0, definitely right in the middle of the polar covalent range. And if we move this a little further, carbon to fluorine. So again, carbon at 2.5, fluorine at 4.0 on the Pauling scale, a difference of 1.5. And we're starting to approach the threshold of what's considered polar covalent. If this bond was just a little more polar, it might be considered ionic. Cool. Now let's kind of go textbook ionic compound from here. And so if we go textbook ionic compound, let's say we choose sodium chloride. So and if we look at the Pauling scale there for sodium chloride, you'll see that chlorine's at 3.0 and sodium, I gotta look that one up myself, is at 0.9. So 0.9 to 3.0, we've got a difference of 2.1 past that threshold. And indeed, we've got an ionic bond. And that bigger the difference in electronegativities here, uh, you know, the more ionic character we'd say that has. And, and notice we've got a metal and a non-metal and that works out great. And most of the time in Gen Chem, so you are not gonna have, you know, all these uh, electronegativity values available to you. And so we just gave you this simple rule to remember. We said metal, non-metal ionic, two non-metals covalent. But I wanna point out a couple exceptions there. And, and in fact, just one really major exception. So, and I'm gonna give you the carbon magnesium bond. Now carbon's a non-metal, magnesium's a metal, and, and in Gen Chem we would have considered, we would have, you know, trained you to consider this as an ionic bond. But if you actually look at the electronegativity value, you see that carbon is at 2.5 and magnesium's at 1.2. That is only a difference of 1.3. It's a polar covalent bond, and it's a pretty polar polar covalent bond, but it technically is not ionic. And uh, in second semester, we're going to deal with a reagent called a Grignard reagent, which definitely looks at a carbon magnesium bond as a polar covalent bond. So definitely wanted to kind of 
cover the fact that we've got some exceptions there. Now, what are you supposed to take away from this? Well, the truth is this. Again, you're still not going to have a table of electronegativities in front of you at all times. So what we're going to expect of you is when you're dealing with two nonmetals, I expect you to know that two identical atoms, nonpolar. Carbon to hydrogen, nonpolar. Most of the time outside of that, though, if you've got two different nonmetals, you should probably just kind of, you know, go with your gut and say, that's probably going to be polar. So sweet. And then most of the time, metal and non-metal, it's going to be ionic. Although we won't encounter that a whole lot in organic chemistry. We'll be dealing mostly with covalent bonding and stuff like that. So, so even that rule of thumb we gave you in Gen Chem, it's still pretty useful to you here in O Chem. But I did want to point this one bond out because we will play with that a little bit in second semester. So now we're going to take a little time identifying when molecules are polar versus nonpolar, and also kind of being able to rank relative polarities, as this, again, will be important to our discussion of intermolecular forces in the next lesson. All right, so first thing you should look for when you're trying to identify if a molecule is polar is you're going to look for polar bonds. So if you look at this bottom example here, so you've got carbon-carbon bonds. Those are definitely nonpolar, as we just stated. And carbon-hydrogen bonds, we also saw those are below the threshold, and those are considered nonpolar. And so for a molecule that doesn't have any polar bonds, it is simply going to be a nonpolar molecule. So first thing you want to look for is just look for polar bonds. So Cool, but if we look at the example of carbon dioxide here, so in this case, you want to look for polar bonds, and a carbon oxygen bond is indeed polar. We'll find out that actually double bonds are significantly more polar than single bonds when they're polar, anyways. Uh, in this case, this guy's got polar bonds, however, that's not enough. You then have to look at the orientation of those polar bonds to see if they cancel or not, so to speak. So if you look at that carbon oxygen bond, we often represent a bond dipole like so. And we've got another one right on the other side. And this carbon's sp hybridized. The bond angles are 180 degrees. And so if you add these two bond dipoles together as vectors, the vector sum is going to be zero. And we say that they cancel. And as a result, this molecule is going to be nonpolar. Cool. Now, if you look at the difference here with the one I've got below, so very similar molecule, but one of the oxygens is replaced by a sulfur. And the carbon-sulfur bond, there's a smaller difference in electronegativity, and a smaller difference in electronegativity is gonna to lead to a less polar bond. And so as a result, because these are not equal in polarity, and notice I've driven, kind of drawn a smaller arrow on purpose there, with a smaller arrow, so or, or a smaller bond dipole anyways, these are not gonna add up to zero. And as a result, overall, this molecule is going to be polar. And in fact, we can, after drawing these individual bond dipoles, you add them up, it's still going to overall, the molecule is still going to have a bond, di or sorry, a dipole overall pointing to the left. And that overall dipole would look like so. And you might be asked to draw an overall molecular dipole. So these are individual bond dipoles. And then in blue, there's an overall molecular dipole. Cool. So look for polar bonds. You don't have any. It's nonpolar. If you do, though, you have to see if they add up to a vector sum of zero, if they cancel. If they do, that's a nonpolar molecule. But if they don't add up to zero, as is the case here, that's going to be a polar molecule. Cool. But in addition to just being able to see if a molecule is polar or not, you might have to compare relative polarities, which is why I've got this series of molecules up here. And relevant to this discussion, a measure of polarity is what's often called the dipole moment, it's symbolized by the Greek letter mu right here. Uh, and it's equal to the difference in electronegativity, or the, I shouldn't really say the difference in electronegativity, but the partial charges that result from the difference in electronegativity. So times the distance of separation between those two atoms. So in this case, a bigger partial charge, which is the result of a bigger difference in electronegativity, is going to lead to a more polar bond. And that's the part of this definition we really want to focus on here. So, all right, if we look at this series of molecules, we'll start with methane here, and there's no polar bonds in this whatsoever. And therefore, the overall dipole moment is zero. It's a nonpolar molecule. Okay, no, no surprise there. But in this next example, that carbon chlorine bond, that's a polar bond. Chlorine is significantly more electronegative than carbon. And so having a polar bond, we have to ask ourselves, okay, are there multiple polar bonds and do they cancel? Well, no, that's the only polar bond, which means there's nothing to cancel it out. And overall, the entire molecule has a dipole running right up the center of it. The bottom part of this molecule, the way I've drawn it, is partially positive. The top part's partially negative. That's what happens in a polar molecule. One side will be partially positive, another side will be partially negative. Cool. Bond dipole here is 1.87 Debye, and that's just a common use, you use for uh, dipole moments. I wouldn't worry too much about it. 
in this case, we look at the next example here. Now we've got two electronegative atoms, two chlorines, but you might notice that the dipole moment actually decreases from 1.87 Debye to 1.6 Debye. So, and if I ask most of my freshmen and sophomores, like which one of these is more polar? Nine out of 10 students are gonna choose the second one to be more polar. Like it's got two chlorines, Chad, come on. So, well, let's take a look at it, investigate and see why indeed it actually is less polar. Well, there are two polar bonds and we can draw in those bond dipoles. So, and when you've got multiple bond dipoles, you have to add them together. And in this case, if they point the same direction, that increases the polarity. When they point in exactly opposite directions, they cancel each other out and stuff like this, as long as they get equal uh, polarity associated with them, as they do in this case. So the question is, are these pointing more in the same direction? Then they're gonna be additive and the polarity should increase. Or are they pointing more in opposite directions? Then that should cause a decrease in polarity. So in this case, the bond angles, are 109.5. This is an sp3 hybridized carbon here. And being 109.5, so notice 90 is the threshold. If you have a bond angle smaller than 90 between them, they'd point more in the same direction and then to add together. If the bond angle, as it is in this case, is bigger than 90 degrees, then actually these cancel each other out more than they add. And that's why the overall dipole moment of this molecule went down. Now, if we want to draw the uh, overall molecular dipole moment here, it'd just be the average of these two, which would run right down the center of them. And again, you could be expected to draw an overall molecular dipole like this guy. Now, if we look at this next one here, we've got three chlorines now. And if you notice our dipole moment went down even further, 1.01 Debye, and we can draw those three bond dipole moments. And again, the key is every angle between any two chlorines you choose is 109.5. They're all bigger than 90. And so they cancel each other out more than they add, all three of them. And your dipole moment overall is going down a little further. And if you take the average of all three of these individual bond dipoles, you have a dipole moment running right down the middle of this molecule, right in between all three of these, so to speak. A little hard to draw from this perspective. Cool, finally, now you get to carbon tetrachloride here where you've got four carbon chlorine bonds. And now they actually add up to a vector sum of zero, just like we saw in carbon dioxide up here. These four all add up to zero and that's why now this is a nonpolar molecule with a dipole moment of zero. Cool, and again, in summary, the big point of this lesson is for you to be able to identify when molecules are polar versus nonpolar, and also maybe to compare some relative polarities in certain cases. So again, one of those big intermolecular forces we're gonna talk about in the next lesson are dipole-dipole forces. And the, the key is polar molecules will have them and nonpolar molecules won't. And so being able to predict when they're polar and when they're not, or which is more polar, will be an important skill you'll need to have for the next lesson. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share. And if you're looking for practice problems and study guides to go along with this, uh, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. Happy studying.